in industry was working as a component design engineer at uh, Intel Corporation in Bangalore. Uh, his uh, interest uh, is uh, ranging from uh, wide areas from MRAM, Spintronic uh, devices for communication, Spintalk uh, devices, uh, devices for bio inspired com computing, spin in quantum materials, and uh, computational Spintronics. And he's also a recipient of uh, various national and international level awards. So, uh, Professor Rahul, it is a pleasure to welcome you here, and uh, uh, we are looking forward for a very interesting talk. Uh, it's uh, over to you. You can uh, share your screen. Thanks. Thanks. I can see the screen. Uh, I think, um, yeah, I'm not sure, but I, I, I cannot hear you. Uh, what about others? Uh, he is uh, muted. Can you unmute? Okay, I have unmuted. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now you can hear. Thanks. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Naveen, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Professor Mudli, for inviting me to present at this workshop. So the title of my presentation is I will be talking about magneto-ionic devices. How can these magneto-ionic devices be used in uh, high density to make high density memory and also for neuromorphic uh, hardware? So the work that I'll be showing in this uh, today's presentation, it is uh, mostly done during my PhD and postdoctoral research, which I did under Professor Hunsu Yang at the National University of Singapore. So talking about Spintronics, so one of the uh, popular and one of the most practical application of Spintronic is towards making MRAM, that is random access memory. And currently the spin transfer torque based memory has been commercialized. So what happens in spin transfer torque memory is we have two ferromagnetic layer divided by a spacer layer and a current is passed through it. And this current actually changes the state of the free layer. However, there is a small barrier layer which is insulator and due to when we pass current through it so many times, the barrier eventually breaks down. Therefore, this STT memory normally has low endurance. A solution to this uh, STT memory is uh, something called as SOT memory, SOT devices. In SOT devices, what is the good thing is we have two separate paths for reading and writing. In this STT, we have a single path for reading and writing. In SOT, we have two separate paths for reading and writing the thing. Therefore, the advantage is the endurance is high and there is more read margin. You can pass a lower read current to read the device. However, the SOT memory cell has a very big disadvantage. If we see how a STT cell is implemented in a memory, normally in a memory architecture, a one STT cell requires one transistor. However, a SOT cell requires two transistors, one for reading and one for writing. So therefore, the density, if you make a big memory out of this, the density of SOT memory will be quite high and therefore the price of this SOT memory will be very high. So this higher aerial density is a challenge for SOT cell. However, instead of uh, having the two transistor for one cell, if we have SOT architecture, something like this, we have a single write channel on which we ke keep the various beds and we have only one write access transistor in there. So the total number of transistor required per cell reduces drastically. Now there is only one transistor required per cell for reading and one write access transistor at end of the write line. So if we have some architecture like this, then the uh, basically the aerial density of SOT memory can be reduced a lot. If we look in this, uh, for example, if this particular architecture that we proposed, if we see it in a three, three by three memory architecture, it will look something like this. So these are the write channels, which are basically heavy metals, and this is the write access transistor, and these are the read access transistor for each cell. 
with our collaborators in Boria, we did some spice simulation, and we found that the aerial density of this particular uh, SOT memory is actually twice compared to the conventional SOT memory, in which uh, there is two tran transistor per unit cell. Now let's take a look with this particular architecture for SOT. How can we perform the reading and writing operation? So the reading operation is pretty simple. If you want to read the elements in this particular row, what you will do is you will turn on the read access transistor and which will basically ground this uh, particular uh, write line, this particular shared channel. And then you can just read the resistance of each individual MTJ using this uh, read lines. So this is how the read operation can be carried out. The main challenge is, challenge is how to carry out the write operation. Now, as uh, we saw previous in the previous slide, the architecture is something like this. You have a shared write channel and you have the bit sitting on top of it. Now, in a uh, spin orbit talk device, the switching occurs either due to the spin hall effect or uh, the Ritzwa effect. But basically, when you pass a current through this uh, channel, some spin current is generated. Spin is accumulated at this interface of magnet and the associated force. The direction of this accumulated spin depends normally on this heterostructure, what kind of heterostructure you are using. Now, what is going to happen is the direction of spin under these three bits is going to be the same. So, therefore, when you pass the current, right, these three bits are going to switch in the same direction. Either they will switch up or they will all switch down. So, basically, you can write information like 111 or 000. If you want to write the information like 101, this is not possible because the direction of spin accumulation under each bit is same. In order to write this information, what you need is under this spin, the spin accumulation, let's say it is pointing inwards. For this particular bit, the spin accumulation is pointing outward. And for this particular spin, the, again, the spin accumulation is pointing inward. However, in the current SOT heterostructure, this is not possible. Normally, if you make the heterostructure, the spin accumulation direction will be safe. So, what is required is we want the SOT bit such that the direction of spin accumulation is uh, afterwards. Direction of spin accumulation is basically dynamically programmable. So, for this, we make use of this particular structure, which consists of a very thin layer of platinum around 1.5 1, 1 to 2 nanometer. And then we deposit a 0.8 nanometer cobalt on it and a 3 nanometer layer of gadolinium oxide. The good property of gadolinium oxide is it is a very good uh, conductor of oxygen. This particular film we uh, fabricate in form of a hall bar. And at the center of the film, we deposit a gadolinium, gadolinium oxide gate. And on top of this gate, we deposit this gate electrode. Using this gate electrode, basically we will apply a positive or a negative voltage. Now let's see what happens when we apply positive or negative volt gate voltage on this device. So in this hall bar, we perform this well-known uh, first and second harmonic hall voltage. So second and uh, the harmonic hall measurements are basically used to measure the spin hall angles in a uh, spin hall angle or spin torque efficiency in a SOT system. So in the initial device, after, as we deposit the device and we measure the first and the second harmonic, so the first harmonic looks something like this, and we apply a magnetic field either parallel to the direction of current or perpendicular to the direction of current. This is to measure the two different types of fields that are present in the SOT. So the second harmonic looks something like this. So if you see, there is a peak here, positive peak here for positive field, same here, two positive peaks here. So this is a normal signal that is obtained from a platinum cobalt heterostructure. Next, what we do, we apply a gate voltage of 10 volt for some time. And then we remove this gate voltage. After that, we perform the harmonic measurement again. What we see is that the, first of all, the magnitude of this AHE has reduced because the oxygen comes in and it oxidizes the cobalt. Surprisingly, what we see that the second harmonic signal, it actually flips the sign. Instead of positive, now it becomes negative, both in the parallel and perpendicular uh, configuration. This type of harmonic hall signal is actually seen in uh, materials with negative spin hall angle like tantalum and uh, hofnium. So, which is very surprising from a, that in a platinum cobalt system, you are seeing a spin hall angle of a 
tantalum, negative spinal angle. Next, we apply a positive gate voltage of 4 volt. Again, we measure the first and second harmonic signal. After applying positive gate voltage and measuring, we see that the second harmonic uh, voltage now again becomes positive as shown in this figure. Next, we again apply negative gate volt. Now the second harmonic again changes its sign. Therefore, by applying negative, positive and negative voltage, we are able to toggle the spin hall angle in this system, which is what we initially discussed that we need. So we are able to dynamically program the spin hall angle in the system. And this can be used to basically create this multi-bit memory cell. So we also demonstrate unipolar switching. So normally in SOT device, if you want to change the direction of switching, you have to change the direction of current. So we measured this uh, current induced switching in the our structure. So this is how the switching looks in the initial device state in which no voltage has been applied. So for a positive gate current, the magnet switches up. For a negative gate negative current, the magnet switches down. Once we apply a negative voltage, what happens? Now for the positive current, the magnet switches down. For negative current, it switches up. After applying positive voltage, the direction of switching again reverses. When we apply negative voltage, the direction of switching again becomes opposite. So what we see basically is that by applying same polarity of uh, uh, current pulse, you are able to switch the magnet up, down, up, down. So this is not possible in conventional SOT device. However, with the gate programmability, you can do this thing. So in this, we have shown that by applying uh, a similar unidirectional current pulse, you can change the state of the device from up, down, up, down. So what is happening in the device? Let's look at what is the physics behind this. Why is the SOT getting changed? So this is how the device look in the normal state. You have the platinum, you have cobalt, and you have the gadolinium oxide layer. Uh, now the main source of SOT in this case is due to the spin hall effect of platinum. And you get the normal positive SOT polarity, which is seen in the platinum cobalt layer. When we apply negative gate voltage, what happens is the oxygen from this gadolinium oxide reservoir, it actually comes in and comes in the cobalt and it oxidizes the cobalt and the platinum interface. Due to this oxidized interface, another kind of SOT is present due to the interfacial SOT, due to the interfacial nature. And for this particular combination, this interfacial SOT is actually opposite to that spin hall effect. So these two torque actually compete with each other. And when you oxidize it too much, this interfacial SOD actually exceeds the spin hall effect and you finally get a negative SOT polarity. So your device gives a negative SOT polarity like that. Next, you apply a positive gate voltage. So the oxygen that was at the interface is again driven back up at the gadolinium oxide. And this interfacial SOT is no more and what you see is again only the spin hall effect and the SOT polarity is only positive. Since there is a competition between spin hall effect and interfacial effect and spin hall effect is normally proportional to the thickness of heavy metal till some thickness. Therefore, this effect is only observed for plat very thin platinum layer like 1.5 to 2 nanometer. If you increase the platinum thickness beyond 2.5 nanometer, this interfacial SOT can never exceed the spin hall effect here for the thicker platinum and we never see a negative sign. So we can, uh, so in this we show that we can modulate the spin hall angle, the value of the spin hall angle from a very positive value. This is for normal platinum. If we apply the gate voltage for some time, for example, 40 seconds, 30 seconds, you can dynamically program your device to have various values of spin hall angle as in what we want. And since this oxygen is moving under the application of gate voltage, and when you remove the gate voltage, the oxygen stays there. Therefore, this uh, particular thing is non-volatile. The effect that we observe is non-volatile. So you apply the gate voltage and you remove the gate voltage and you see the same state. So therefore, the spin hall angle as we show in this can program by applying various gate voltage from positive to here zero. And then here we have very negative gate voltage of minus 0.1. Then again, we apply opposite positive gate voltage. So oxygen goes back up. Then again, we have here zero spin hall angle, and again, we have positive spin hall angle. What happened? I think my screen got.
Uh, yeah, I think it went into the present tense mode and it's yeah. frozen, I think. Yeah, to start again. Just a second. Sure. Yes, I hope you can see the slides. Uh, yes, it's open. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so now after uh, establishing that, yes, indeed we can have a device in which the SOT can be dynamically programmed. Let's go back to our previous discussion in which we made this three by three memory. And now we see how we can perform this write operation. So now let's say if you want to write some information, let's say 101 in this particular device, what you will do in step one, you will apply some negative voltage to this uh, particular device and apply positive voltage. So when you apply negative voltage, this particular bit will have negative SOT polarity under it. These other two bits will have positive SOT polarity. And now when you pass in the second step, when you pass a current through this particular shared right channel, so these two bits with positive SOT polarity will switch up and this middle bit, which we have programmed in the opposite way, will switch down. Therefore, now you can write all sort of uh, digital information, all combination of digital information in this uh, particular uh, area efficient memory. So this is about the simulation, but we also try to implement this multi-bit memory device. So in a particular, we make this, take this two bits, we make two hall bars, joint hall bars, and these two bits are connected by two separate gates. And we try, we show that these two separate gates can be controlled independently as shown in this figure. For example, in this state one, this particular gate was programmed to have a positive SOT polarity and the second gate was, the second bit was having negative polarity. And similarly, the polarity can be changed also. For example, here the first one is negative polarity and the second one is positive polarity. So the two bits can be independently programmed, which is the requirement of our shared right channel memory. And these two bits can be show that they can be switched also independently. So this is the normal state, the initial device state. So if you pass the current through the shared light right channel, both the bits switch in the same direction, right? As you can see here. Now we apply negative gate voltage on this particular bit too. Now what happens when we pass a current, this bit switches up, this bit switches down for a positive current. Next we apply negative gate voltage on bit one. Now both the bit switches in the opposite direction. Finally, we apply positive gate voltage here. Now what happens, this but first bit switches down for positive current, the second bit switches up for the uh, positive current. So therefore you are able to as you can see in this summary, by applying same current polarity, that's the positive current polarity, you are able to write all this uh, combination, all this combination of two-bit information, 11100001 one, one, zero, 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 one, in this particular uh, shared right channel. Okay. So to conclude this part of the talk, so basically the direction of spin accumulation can be changed by electric field in this particular infrastructure. The channel region can be programmed so that different part of the channel has different spin wall angle. And this is very promising for future SOT MRM architecture, especially for high density application. And it is also promising for uh, uh, logic and FPGA like circuits. So in my second part of the talk, I'm going to show that this particular magnet of ionic device can actually be used for some kind of neuromorphic hardware also. So a brief introduction about neuromorphic hardware. So I think around 2014, there was a computer AlphaGo. There is a computer AlphaGo by Google. And it actually beat Lee Shadol from Korea in this uh, game of AlphaGo. Sorry, there is a computer and AlphaGo is the game, I'm sorry. And everyone was praising this until someone pointed out that AlphaGo actually uses tons of uh, CPU and tons of scientists were involved. Basically, it's a very power hungry device. On the other hand, Lee Shadol is just a very small human brain and it's operating on one coffee and some uh, small breakfast. So the conclusion is basically human brain is a very efficient uh, computer, a very efficient thing to perform some very specific tasks, which the normal computer takes very high energy to do. So how does a human brain operates? So inside the human brain, you have this small cells called as neurons. And these neurons are interconnected with each other. 
So one particular neuron is actually connected to around 10 to the power five other neurons. And in a normal human brain, there are 10 to the power 11 neurons. So what happens is one particular neuron emits a potential spike. This potential is by this calcium and sodium ions. This potential spikes, it goes in this gap between the two neurons. And this gap between the two neuron, which is known as synapse, this is where normally it is believed that the human memory or memory in a normal uh, animal world lies. What this synapse does is it adds weight to this potential spike. It will either increase the potential of this spike or it will decrease the potential of this spike. As you can see here, it can decrease or increase by adding weight. And once these all these potential spike basically add up in this particular neuron, and when the potential of this uh, neuron exceeds some predetermined th threshold, this neuron will also fire a spike, potential spike, and that spike will go to the next neuron. And by firing of these various spikes, this is how the neural uh, computation occurs. So, to mimic this neural computation, we already know now there is a famous field of uh, famous area of artificial intelligence. It works by mimicking this uh, biological neural network. However, it is slightly different in which various neurons are basically arranged in this different layers. These are the hidden layer. This is the input layer, output layer. And again, same type of computation is carried out. Basically, there is a weighted summation. So all these inputs are multiplied by the various weights and all inputs are connected to the output, all the outputs of the next layer. And then in this weighted summation at the neuron, they are basically then computed using this uh, neural function, basically a, a nonlinear function in which they can have two different values. So if we want to ma make basically a human brain, what we require is we have to implement this particular ar architecture. Problem is with CMOS is uh, in silicon, if you want to implement this synapse and neurons, to implement each synapse and neuron, you require 10 to 15 devices. So what is required is you if a single device can do the function of this synapse, that is can store this weight, analog weight, and also can do the neural function, it would be great. So let's see how our device can actually work as a magnetic synapse. So as I mentioned previously, the role of synapse is to, is to store analog weight. So if you remember in our cobalt GDWorks device, when we apply negative weight voltage, what happens is that the oxygen comes in and it oxidizes the cobalt. The result of oxidation of cobalt is that the magnetization of the cobalt reduces drastically. And you apply a positive weight voltage, the oxygen goes back up and the uh, magnetization increases again. So if we if magnetization we consider as a measure of weight, so we can program this magnetization by controlling how much oxygen is there in the cobalt. And this weight or this magnetization can basically be measured by measuring the AHE loop, simple AHE measurement it will do, so we will know the weight. So all these different values can be programmed in this uh, small device. So for example, as shown here, by applying various gate voltage pulses, you can have your device to store all these weights, which can be measured in form of the anomalous fall resistance. By applying, so in the next four or five slides, I'll show that this particular cobalt GDOX platinum device actually shows various properties of a biological synapse. So a biological synapse, and if you increase, apply some stimulus, its weights will increase. And if you apply a negative stimulus, its weight actually decreases. So same thing we see in our device. If you apply a stimulus, the weight can actually gradually increase. And the most important thing is it can have all these different weights, which is not possible in a silicon memory. So it can all have these different weights and a single device can be used as a synapse. And you apply a negative weight voltage, the weight keeps on decreasing and you can have all these weights also again. Okay. So this uh, increase of weight is called potentiation and decrease is called depression. Next is the spike magnitude dependence. So normally in a human synapse, right, if your stimulus is high, then the weight changes quickly or weight changes by a large amount. Same thing we see here, if we apply a gate voltage of let's say 8 volt at 20 millisecond, then the change in the RAHE or change in the magnetization is less. However, if a larger stimulus is applied, then the change is very large in the device. Next is temporal dependence. In human brain also, if we get stimulus very quickly, the change in the synapse is more. If some events occur very quickly, we form a very strong memory. So same thing we see in our device also. If we apply 
when he multiple pulses to our device. However, if the delay between these pulses is very small, we see that there is a large change in the weight of the our device. However, if the gap between the various uh, stimulus pulses is large, for example, 400 millisecond, then the change in the RAH or change in the weight of the device is not very much. So this behavior is also similar to the human synapse. Second is the spike timing dependence. If you apply a positive and the negative burst together, and if they are close by, then again there is a very high. If they are close by, then the change in the synapse rate is very large. However, if they are far apart, then there is almost no change in the synapse rate. Finally, our device also shows learning and forgetting behavior. For example, if we increase the weight of our device by applying these gate voltage pulses for uh, some time, and then after this moment, we just don't apply any pulses. Then we measure the state of the device. We see that the RAG or the weight of the device keeps on decreasing gradually. This is similar to a human brain in which uh, if you keep repeating something, you have a nice memory. However, as soon as you stop repeating it, you gradually start forgetting. However, in a human brain, if you don't repeat something for a long time, you keep forgetting. So this is what our device shows. So we train the device till here. After this, we leave the device. So we see that the device keeps forgetting at the same rate. However, if we train the device now, that is after this particular, when we arrive at this moment, now we apply this pulse here for a very long time. So what happens is, if we apply that pulse at the top uh, uh, peak for let's say 10 times, then the forgetting is there. If you apply for 20 times, then the forgetting becomes slower. Apply for 30 times, then the forgetting becomes even slower. Apply 40 times, then there is very slow forgetting. So actually this can be fitted by this kind of, uh, we can, uh, this exponential forgetting time, I will say decay time, we can say. And as the number of training pulses increases, the rate at which uh, the synapse forgets what is stored in is keeps on increasing. So this is similar to long-term memory formation in main brain, in which if you keep repeating things for a long time, you do not tend to forget it. So, long. so basically through these slides, I have shown this uh, magnetoionic device can not only be used in non volatile memory, but also it shows many behavior of this human uh, synapse, biological synapse. So with this, I come to end of my talk and yeah, thank you all for your attention and I would be glad to take any questions. Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, interesting talk. Now uh, the talk is open to questions from the audience. I think I already have some things in the chat. Uh, but uh, Swamiru, if you want to ask uh, the question directly, you can go ahead. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. So the idea of using this shared uh, right channel is to just, uh, I mean, enhance the memory density, real memory density. Right. Uh, right. And now you, uh, now, uh, yeah, we use this gate voltage and we can use that, but that also required each uh, voltage source, gate voltage source for each bit. So is it uh, not affecting the real density of, I mean, for each bit now we use, use a, uh, we need a get a get voltage source or something like that. No, so wait a minute. So if you see, we are the we are applying the gate voltage. Can you see my slide? I hope. Yes, sir. Yeah, we can still see. Yeah. So this is the memory architecture. So yeah. normally, okay, I'll go to the read operation. So the reading we carry out like this, right? So the gate voltage we apply through this read path only. From where we are carrying the reading. So there is no extra circuit or no extra transistor required for this gate voltage bus. We will of course have some circuit here, one small circuit for reading and one small circuit for applying gate voltage. But that is it. For individual bit, there is no difference. The same path is used for reading and the same path can be used for applying okay. gate voltage from top. Another uh, question was that that cobalt, when cobalt becomes oxide, so yeah. it is still a ferromagnetic or it's a CO3, CO4 or something. Sometimes cobalt oxide are anti-ferromagnetic also. No, so it is not always completely oxidized. We do not oxidize it to a very extreme uh, extent. So it remains ferromagnetic. As you can see, we can still measure the AHE loop and also it remains ferromagnetic here. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Sachin, I think uh, you have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Raul, for my, for a nice talk and good to see you after a long time. Yeah. So I have a question um, on slide eight and nine. So 
So you said that your platinum thickness was uh, two nanometer. Yeah. So I believe it is the less than the spin diffusion length. And uh, you said that um, when you increase this platinum thickness, you don't see the effect of the oxidation. Right. So, uh, so it means then um, when you your platinum is uh, more than spin diffusion length, then um, like you are more sensitive to the bulk effects. And when it is very thin, you are sensitive to the interfacial effect, and that's why you right, say right. that. Uh, right. So, so uh, what is your comment on uh, like when you change the gate voltage? So you are changing the band structures at the top interface, and your cobalt is. Uh, your cobalt thickness is too small. So what would you comment that uh, when cobalt is too thin, your two interfaces, they are no longer separated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the effect might be because of the change in the band structure at the top interface. Change of band structure at the top interface. Top interface. And maybe there is a, uh, there's a RASBA kind of interface at cobalt gadolinium, or you are changing the band structures. So I yeah, cannot comment whether some the kind of two uh, electron gas. Yeah, yeah. So I cannot comment if the change is happening at the top interface or it is happening at the bottom interface. But I believe it is the bottom interface where the things are happening because if it was due to the top interface, mm -hmm. then even in a normal cobalt and oxide interface, we should see some kind of uh, this very large spin hole which we don't see. So I believe because you know the presence of platinum, only in presence of platinum we see this uh, opposite sign. So this oxidation at the platinum cobalt interface is what plays a major role in uh, switching the sign rather than the cobalt and the top oxide interface. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Sajid, go ahead, you can ask your question. And Thank also you just, uh, for very nice, uh, nice talk. Yeah. I have a connection question with the uh, with Sachin. So uh, with the oxidation, uh, because you see the the, uh, the hysteresis with mm -hmm. oxidation, you never uh, uh, regain your initial hysteresis or initial initial state of magnetization. Even right. uh, in 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 second harmonic signal, your your anisotropy basically reduced a lot. Even I think one point five tesla or even more. Right. So, uh, I was wondering that if you perform this operation for uh, more than uh, even increase, increase, then do, do you think that uh, you are losing the state with time? And yeah, exactly. ultimately, you will lose everything. We are losing, I didn't get it the last. Uh... Sorry, uh, sorry, you didn't hear that. No, what is the last statement we are losing? Oh, so you, you because you, with time, because in every operation, yeah, I think yeah, you I are think losing the anisotropy. So if, uh, maybe after operation of uh, maybe thousand or something like that, you yeah, will yeah. not uh, yeah. achieve so, anything. I mean, although we did not try it for a very long time, but for a short time, as you can see here, we do not lose much actually. But uh, although we did not try for a very long uh, duration of repetition, but I'm sure if we keep doing repeating this thing, then it will keep losing its uh, particular magnetization also and also the PMA. So you never actually go back in this initial state, which has a very high PMA. For example, here we also applied 4 volt, but you can see here at the PMA, this is not as good as this. But what we observed is after you do it, let's say for 10, 20 times, then it enters into some kind of stable state where there are only two stable states. For example, this and this. And with positive and negative gate voltage, it uh, keeps on oscillating between the two state, although it cannot go to the initial very good state, but it keeps oscillating in this uh, two intermediate state, which are not the best, but are still workable from a device point of view. Okay. But yeah, the one main drawback is you need a very good control over uh, this oxygen migrations, but it is not very easy to control. When you apply gate voltage, sometimes there is more oxidation less. So you end up with uh, some uh, different states, different time. Mm -hmm. And you need some particular thickness of gadolinium oxide to to do this operation, or or it works in, for any thickness. Some particular thickness of gadolinium oxide, the oxidation. Uh, yeah, so we, basically there are a few requirements. Actually, this uh, transfer of oxygen from this top to bottom, 
this requires uh, normally what uh, I have seen is if you have a thinner gate oxide, then it is easier to transfer this oxygen. And also a thinner gate electrode on top, then it is easier to transfer oxygen back and forth. However, if this GDOX is thicker, then you have to apply a very gate volt, high gate voltage, obviously, to transfer the gate oxide. So th thinner, thinner GD oxide is preferred. Another point which I totally forgot to mention is that for many times, you know, this gate voltage you have to apply at high temperature so that this uh, oxygen migration can accelerate and it can uh, move uh, faster compared to room temperature. At room temperature, this migration is lower. So normally we increase the temperature and apply this gate voltage. So this, this migration is faster. And I know uh, it's a connection with the Sachin question because uh, what is the purpose to use a 0 0.8 cobalt? Because in this thickness range, your as Sachin said, the, the two interface basically start to talk each other, and Rushba yeah. can have a, a so large normally so, so. cobalt uh, PMA is normally obtained for uh, for platinum cobalt PMA is obtained for 0.8 to 2 nanometer, not more than that. So anyway, right. we are limited by one upper limit of thickness. And what we have seen is that 0.81 nanometer gives a very nice PMA, and after you increase the one nanometer, the PMA kind of decreases. Uh, so okay. that's one reason why I used a thinner cobalt layer. But anyway, okay. we tried this thing for uh, even two nanometer cobalt, and you can see the same effect. You can still for two nanometer cobalt also you can give us a direction of uh, this SOT. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. All right, thanks a lot uh, for these interesting questions. If someone has uh, other questions, we can move over to the chat area. And uh, once again, thank you, Professor Mishra, for the interesting talk. So we go to the next talk. Could you stop the?